Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are merging the streams of sports and the new platform. It's going to be uh, launching before your very eyes a little later on in the week. No better week to do it than Cleveland Browns week in the kickoff to the football season. WNST, all of our coverage, especially for these incredible Baltimore Positive segments. Not this guy's left Baltimore. He doesn't get the Taharka ice cream that he used to get when he left <laughs> here in Baltimore before we talked to Kevin Byrne. Got a little plug for Vanilla Bean. We uh, think the offense won't be vanilla. I think Mike Nolan might have other, other uh, references to Vanilla Bean ice cream, but made here in Baltimore, not in D.C., and serving up social change. It is Taharka, one of our great sponsors. Um, this guy's in South Carolina. If he weren't, we would bring him maybe downtown for some faith. These crab cakes, even though he's definitely <laughs> allergic to shellfish last I checked. Uh, and, you know, but not beer or not other things as well. Maybe some macaroni and cheese, as well as our friends over at State Fair in Catonsville, uh, where we would have some chicken and waffles and shrimp and grits. And Moeller and Gary Realty. Give a shout out to Jeff Moeller. They're selling houses. Find them out on the internet. Don Moeller and Kevin Byrne are together uh, for the first time on a Zoomer with me here. Virtually. And I, virtually. <laughs> and Kevin's in South Carolina. I all, you know, the night I introduced you guys at Amici's, when I became nationally syndicated 22 years ago now, right, I thought maybe there'll be a day we'll all be together on this thing called the Internet. And Kevin will be retired on a golf course in South Carolina. <laughs> and Don will be retired and being my partner uh, after becoming the Baltimore County executive. Uh, and I'll be launching this thing called Baltimore Positive with a picture of Art Modell, you know, over my, uh, my shoulder, smiling down <laughs> upon me. Um, and my Hall of Fame was Sig cartoon here on the <laughs> Cleveland leg lamp after talking to Michael Red Guy. So I'll let you guys talk amongst yourselves. How are you? No. Kevin? <laughs> I'm doing fine. It's an exciting week. You know, we, we open up on, on Sunday against those Browns and uh, you know, it's so different because of COVID. It's so different because I've kind of changed my relationship with the Ravens. And, uh, but it's great to see Don. But how'd they change their relationship with you? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's great. Anybody anybody that's been around me for five minutes knows that, uh, that Kevin Byrne is one of my all time uh, favorite people uh, in sport or out of sport. Just a great guy. Kevin, do you, I remember that night. What I remember about that night is you and your wife, like every parent in the world were waiting patiently to find out whether or not your son had won a student council or student government <laughs> race at Calvert Hall. <laughs> That's know, exactly right. We kept Are, waiting. Did he win? Did he win? He did. <laughs> did he win? Con- Connor became the president of the student body at Calvert <laughs> Hall. And then he went on to uh, Boston College where he graduated with a degree in communications. Terrific. No, that was a, that was a great night. And I thank you, Nestor. It really has been the beginning of a, of a terrific, uh, I friendship. knew you guys would be fast friends. Well, I Kev, Kevin, <laughs> Kevin's gotten to know. Hey, I'll tell you what, in Baltimore Positive, and, you know, my wife will tell you this because I'm trying to come up with a catchphrase. Like, like, like the Baltimore Sun is light for all, right? And all the news that's fit to print. I've had intelligent conversation, but I, I'm really – I'm going to get Jeremy Schapp on, and I know you knew Dick Schapp a little bit. Dick Schapp talked about collecting people, collecting yeah. good people. And Don has sat in the upper deck at Ravens games with me for 20 years. And, you know, Baltimore Positive is going to be a collection of good people. And I think if you remember that night at Amici's when I was celebrating an incredible, you know, honor getting, getting nationally syndicated, I was 28 years, 27 years old, 28 years old. And I collected the 25 best people in my life, and you guys were in it. So well, there you are. And here you are thanks, together, man. and we're all still having a good time. We're going to play football in the middle of the plague. How about that, Kev? <laughs> <laughs> well, Master, let me tell you, before we, we get all over Kevin and, and find out what he's up to and, and life and, and, and what's going on, but – uh, we, we really did need some therapy when the word hit that, that Kevin was going to be retiring to South Carolina. Both my boys and my grandchildren immediately went into a fetal <laughs> position because they've become very close with Mr. Byrne and they love their trips to the castle and it was like they were inconsolable but uh, so uh Kevin, tell them you, i don't you, have a press you, pass on sunday will, either so they, you you know, they're not letting me go either how about that so hey kevin i i i, I want to ask you right off the bat because you and i are about the same age very similar contemporaries and you know like a lot of my friends we all go through these transitions my wife went through it um 
I guess your wife has done it too because she had a successful, I think, real estate business up here. And now she's transitioning down there. <clears throat> the question I have for you to share with our listeners a little bit, talk about the process and what you went through as an individual trying to decide what was the right time. Because I think everybody yeah. comes to that separately. And, and I'm really interested as to what your process was and what made 2020 the right time, Kevin. You know, it's interesting, Don, because um, you think as you get older, the decisions become easier and they don't, you know, and uh, they become difficult or they stay difficult, I should say, you know, and uh, that's just part of life. But, you know, I always felt, Ozzie and I, Ozzie Newsom and I have talked about this through the years because we both love our jobs. Uh, Ozzie loves his. Ozzie retired and still goes in every day. You know, um, I retired and they asked me to stay out as a consultant. So I, I'm on Zooms regularly and I talk to people, which is a nice way to, way to do it. But my feeling was that um, someday it would just occur to me, you don't have to do this the rest of your life. And it, it might be a drive into work. It might be a weekend and it might be uh, over at Heinz Field. Like, do I really want to keep doing this? And so really it was uh, uh, last summer, my wife and I were seriously discussing about how long we each wanted to do our work. And we both kind of looked at each other and says, I'm kind of ready, you know, right. and, uh, and, and I knew we were going to be good. And I knew we were going to be better than people thought last year because, you know, I could see Lamar every day. Kevin, you, to you told me that. You told me yeah. that back in late July last year. Yeah. You said people don't know how good we're going to be. Yeah. And, you know, and then we went 14 and two. So the, uh, so I figured if I went through this season, last season, as good as we were and knowing the promise of that and still felt, ah, I, I could walk away from this, then it's the right time to do that. The difficult thing really is then to go to your friends, you know, they're associates by job, but they've become friends. John Harbaugh is a friend. Eric DaCosta and I have played racquetball for almost 25 years, uh, at least once a week. Uh, and in recent years, twice a week. And, and Steve Bishotti has become a friend. Dick Cass has become a friend. So to go to those people and say, you know what, which I did in December, I, 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 this is going to be it. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and then not have regrets during the conversation or after the conversation. And not even a sense of relief. <clears throat> it was like sharing good news. Yeah, I've had my run. It's time for somebody else and others to enjoy this. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of how it happened. And I haven't, and we haven't, my wife and I, Sally and I, haven't had second thoughts about it, uh, you know, because we have some family. We have uh, two sons who live there. Our grandson lives in Baltimore. Uh, but we felt we, we would move to Hilton Head. We'd create a destination for our family. And they've all been here <laughs> and uh, so far. I bet they'll be back, Kevin. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's a nice place to visit. Right. And so it's all worked out very, very well. And the Ravens being so kind to keep me involved uh, makes the easing out even better. Yeah, that's a theme, right? And, and I guess – I've been on the phone with everybody in Cleveland this week, right? So we have Red Guy on and Daryl Ryder and Scott Petrick and other people. And your organization, one of the reasons I think you're, you know, the Ravens will cream the Browns this week, right, is j just because you have your act together. And if there's a team that's going to be able to get away with not having COVID and John's going to rally the troops and do all of that kind of stuff. But then there are the Browns who change socks and change front offices. And there are franchises that, in all sports that are good at keeping people together and bad at keeping people together. This is one of those things where, like, even keeping people together like you and Ozzy, I mean, you see Ozzy goes in every day, right? Like, you're reporting. How many times have you been on a Zoom in the last 30 days with somebody – at one winning drive, right? Like I, you probably don't want to admit how many times you, I, I, the over under would be 30 in 30 days, probably one a day. So I, you know, but there, there is that point where that's the nature of your place. And it probably goes back to this guy, right? I mean, yes. you no. Know, and what was left behind because that's you, you, that they lost him when they lost you, right. To some degree, but there's still lots of elements of all of that. And even in COVID and even with all the craziness going on, there is a familiarity in your building and your organization that 
I don't know, that's probably a lot bigger than football to not make it too misty for you, Kev. You know, uh, I'll, I'll share something from Steve Bishotti, which I think, uh, as you mentioned that, Nestor, it has even more significance to me, but it reflects how the owner thinks. And, and, and a franchise is a reflection of its owner. Just as we reflected art, we now reflect Steve. And how fortunate we were to have somebody like Steve buy the franchise from Art and, and treat Art with such, Art Modell with such deference and, 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 let, I, and let Art hang around uh, until he passed. But anyway, when I was telling Steve that I planned to leave, he kind of chuckled and he goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> I go, well, no. I said, you know, Sally and I have talked about this. You know, uh, this is somewhat serious, Steve. And and uh, so he goes, "Yeah, I know." He goes, uh, but, "But aren't we fun to hang around?" <laughs> and I said, "Yes." <laughs> this is, you know, yeah. this is no indictment. And so then, then when we finished the conversation, I said I had to go. Cause actually, I had to go get uh, um, John Harbaugh for uh, some something that at that time. And Steve, as I'm getting up, he looks at me, he goes, "Hey, we don't want to lose our old guys. So just think about it a little bit." And I thought, well, that's, that's in, in relationship to what Nestor just says, that says something about the way Steve runs his franchise. You know? Well, I was, I was going to get to this later because I want to come back and talk about Kevin Byrne, the young guy, and how you got to where you are. But since you just mentioned Steve, it would, it would not make sense for me not to jump to a question I had much later down the road. By all accounts, Kevin, and I've talked to some folks out there. I may even have texted back and forth with you on this. The, the Ravens and the high marks they're getting and continue to get in their response to the national crisis of violence and the killing of young black men and women and Black Lives Matter, I've been told that the whole desire to get out in front of that that really is reflective of Steve, and that's where Steve is, and the players have such respect that that's where he is. Is that accurate, what I'm being told? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, if you haven't seen it, you know, uh, fans should go to the Ravens website and look at our video, Black Lives Matter, led by Steve Bishotti. How many owners in any business, let alone sports where you're dependent on on, on on red and blue to come to your games uh, uh and steve wanted to be involved in the video and, and his command was i want a nike type video to to tell our story about how important this is and if people don't understand and if people are going to say they're going to get angry at me or my players for taking a stand you know what then Tell them to go watch somebody else because that's not who we are. And I want the world to know it. So, holy cow. You know, that happened quickly, so Kevin, too. I mean, you know, very it, quick. it feels to me like that anybody can go Madison Avenue and take a week and get a Kevin Byrne and five other people who do this and create some BS uh, PR thing. That thing, like, popped up the next morning, and I'm like, I hit you, and I'm like, what was that? I mean, that's yeah. – that thing happened quickly, and I can only imagine Steve just woke up that day, and I know how Steve is, right? And you know how Steve is. Yeah. I mean, the timeline of wherever Steve was that morning and said, we're going to do this, and at the time it came out, it was, it was lightning fast. Yes. You know, and, and when, when he wanted to do it. And then when the players heard that Steve wanted to be on the video – and uh, it was powerful. It was team building. And you talk about a team ready to play. Now, the Browns can certainly beat anybody. That's the nature of the NFL. You know, we could go on Sunday and, and not play that well. But we're prepared as a franchise. And we're walking in there lockstep. We are arm and locked in arm. We are shoulder to shoulder. Uh, we're a franchise to sound a little corny. We're a franchise that loves each other, and, and it's much like a family, and it has disagreements like a family, but, man, we are on the same page, and that is powerful, and it goes to having people who have been together a long time, and, and, and it has to selecting, going back to the 
term we used started long ago to play like a Raven. There is a profile to the type of person we want on our team. And uh, it, it's, I'm very proud, very, very proud to be part of the franchise since the beginning. And, uh, and I think for Baltimore fans, you know, it's going to continue at the highest, highest levels. Well, well, Kevin, does that, did that culture display itself when the players, some of the players went to, uh, to John regarding Earl Thomas and said, enough, enough. I mean, is that, is that part of that culture that you're talking about coming to the forefront there that, that not saying anything necessarily detrimental about Earl, but just, he doesn't get what play like a Raven means. Am I reading too much into that? Well, I'm not going to talk too much about it because, one, I wasn't present every single day. But I I did talk to John, uh, Coach Harbaugh, about it. And I I talked to some people in the organization about it. So, you know, I I know more than I will tell. But there is some of that, yes. You know, uh, John has a leadership committee. And uh, and I think that's, that's a powerful thing for a coach to have. And so he's talking to them all the time. He'll, he'll, you know, and Nestor has seen this where he'll grab the leadership committee at the end of a practice and, and, and John will say, okay, what'd you think of the practice guys? And do we need to come back tomorrow with a longer practice or, or where are we? Are our legs tired? Tell me where we're at. Should we be more in the weight room? And so he looks for feedback. You know, John will still be the dictator in the end, but for him to welcome all that. And the fact, you know, the, the one thing I will say, Earl was, a seven-time Pro Bowler, not on that leadership committee, and uh, and and then that's a little different, you know. Calais Tom, Calais Campbell's, he went right to that leadership committee because of of who he is, and that's a little bit of a knock on Earl, uh, but um, um, but that's not a fake I, I think, thing. That's real. The leadership yeah. committee's not for pretenders. It's no, for the it's real not. deal. It's yeah, yeah. It's you, not, yeah, you have to it's have, not window have, dressing, right? No, and you better have the interests of the team before yourself. And then you can, you can be a leader on that team. Well, Coach Billick would always talk about unfiltered information, right? And that's how yeah. you get unfiltered information. That's what the coach needs to make a decision, right? And that has to come from true, honest leadership. Yes. And, the, and you have to be willing to, um, to listen, and you have to be willing to give back to in, that, in those meetings. Kevin, we've we talked a little bit with Michael Ragai about this. <clears throat> Nestor and I both have some thoughts. Curious, you've been around it so long. Uh, before I give you my thought that people who listen to the show become familiar with, what do you think the impact of 30-some teams playing without fans? How does that how is that going to impact the competitive advantage of one team or another i don't think any of us have ever thought about it before right Right. like literally right like playing an nfl game in silence in silence well well, certainly fans can raise the level of a team there is no doubt about it and football more than any other uh, other team sport is is emotion you know you you have to sustain a high level of emotion to to play the game uh you have to be smart about it and fans help I have seen it. I've seen I've seen crowds in Baltimore just lift the Ravens after a bad start. Say to say, okay, that's right. They're like the players look at each other. Okay, that's a good reminder. You know, we we need to we need to play better. We need to play smarter. We whatever it is. So fans will have that. But I will say this: if you're a great competitor, uh, Don, I know you play golf and you're competing with your sons. Say, you, it doesn't matter who's there. You're finding a way to win. Oh, you know, I, I want to beat both my son and son-in-law <laughs> badly. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> if you're a competitor, I think you can still raise that level. And I've seen in the NBA, and fans have seen in the NBA a little bit if they watch the NBA playoffs, you can hear the teammates on the sideline hooping and hollering and yelling and screaming. They love to win. They love to see great plays made. Uh, so I think what's going to be interesting You'll hear some of that. You'll hear Harbs yelling out, you know. Uh, I used to sound like a high school game, right? Like a little bit like that, right? A little bit, yeah. yeah. Yes, very much so, only with better sound equipment. <laughs> does it, does so, it favor and, yeah, you know, uh, Kevin? It, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes, I was going to say the networks, they're going to look for that. They're going to love to be picking up guys yelling at each other, guys cheering for each other, 
And that'll become a dramatic part of the game outside of the fans. But we're going to miss the fans. There's no doubt. Oh, and Kevin, does it favor? Here's my theory. And, and I've said it enough and blow holes in it if you think I'm wrong. Seems to me that with everything else being equal, the no fans, the neutral sites in effect, favor the teams who are stronger on paper. It just seems to me it, you're taking out other things that could affect the, the outcome, and all of a sudden it becomes talent versus talent. And if my 53 are better than your 53, barring something crazy that day, I think the, the Ravens, the Chiefs, the Cowboys, the others I keep pointing to, you know, the 49ers, I think they suddenly have more of a competitive advantage. Am, am I wrong on that? Well, I, I don't think you're wrong with that, but I think there's another factor. I think teams that have their act together, teams that like each other, and, and teams do like each other. Teams like hanging out with each other. Teams that uh, respect the way the other side of the ball plays, and they see it in training camp. You will see and hear that. You, I, I can see, for, let's take Mark Ingram, for example. I could see Mark Ingram just lifting the defense, you know, coming off the field after a seven-yard touchdown run, and he's running over the defense on his way in saying, hey, shut him down and I'll do it again. Shut him down and I'll do it again. I could see him then standing up near the sideline, yelling at the defense, come on, one time, and we're right back in. And I, so I can see – those teams that, that have that good, strong family feeling are different than some teams where a guy's trotting over. I'm on offense. I'm sitting down. I'm not paying attention. To, let me know when I have to go back out. Kevin Byrne is our guest, the a longtime uh, senior I, – I always get it wrong – executive <laughs> vice president, senior – is that right? <laughs> Close enough. Re re retired. Executive sort of vice president. Big dog, big dog, <laughs> Nestor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, emeritus, I don't even know what. I, do you still have an dog. official title? Or is it, 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 it's the same, but emeritus, or what is it exactly? <laughs> it's it just right now, it, it says executive vice president. Okay. But I don't, have a, I don't have a business card. I didn't get new business cards. Old guy on a golf course <laughs> in South Carolina. Kevin Byrne yeah. joining us here, along with Don Moeller, as uh, we get ready for, for football. Um, let us into the behind the scenes of the COVID thing in, in the building and – your sponsors, just every, so many things have changed oh. for the business of the Ravens. I mean, you picked a heck of a time to leave. I mean, it's like, it's like Kenny Rogers wrote a song about it or something, you know? <laughs> um, but I would think every aspect of what's happened there, not to mention in Atlanta and Tampa and all these other places where maybe everybody doesn't know everybody. They just didn't add a big wing to the building and, you know, have everything redesigned in sort of a new way. I think there's some tremendous com competitive advantage about that, but th the last seven months have been uh, – forget the football players and the football side. The guys and the, and the ladies behind the scenes that make your business run on the other non-16 Sundays of the year – I think every part of it's been upside down for every sports franchise. And in a lot of franchises, a lot of people in your seats got furloughed, sent home. There was no work to do. We didn't know if we were going to play. Uh, it, it's been a crazy eight months for the business of the Baltimore Ravens, right? It, it really has. In fact, more than half of the Ravens employees right now have not been back into the building. And that's just for the protection of the players. So less than half have been in the building to return to work. And uh, there's separation in the offices. Uh, uh, they're, they're wearing devices in the office that alert you if you're within six feet of somebody else. And how about that? I, obviously, the, the, on, on practice, it doesn't happen. But, but if John Harbaugh is walking down the hallway and, and here comes Don Martindale, Wink, our defensive coordinator, uh, when they get within six feet, they each have a little beeper on their wrist that goes off saying they're within six feet and that's close enough. And so I, I think a lot of people at the Ravens deserve credit, but there is a man in charge and he has been exceptional in all this Dick Cass. Dick Cass is our president and he's a very intelligent, smart man. Uh, he can see things uh, uh, in a hurry. He can read things in a hurry. And I think, he has made as much as the transition can be good, he's made it the best. And uh, I give Dick a lot of credit. And, and also Dick's very, very aware that there, there's some lifting that other people have to do. Those in the building have to lift the people outside the building. 
those not in sales have to go put our arms around our sales group and say, I know you're giving lots of money back to people, uh, but this is only hopefully a one season thing. There was a, you know, Dick had to call Steve and say, you know, we probably should give uh, uh, the money back to the season ticket holders. And I can just hear that conversation. Steve said, oh yeah, how much money is there? <laughs> you know, Dick said, oh, you know, probably $60 million. And oh, okay. Yeah. yeah if you think, if you think that's right, go ahead. <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden. That's a hell of a phone off- call. We're, yeah, we're offering that to the fans, and we were, we were the first team to do it. That's a little bit of bragging, but it was the right thing to do. We were the first team that had a plan, you know, for, what, 14,000 fans to come. And then it would change to 7,500, and now for the, at least the first two home games, no fans. But we continually look at it. Uh, we continually try to boost each other up because we all need boosting because it's so different right now. And we don't have the magic that's being a part of the Ravens that we always have. Oh, I can walk down the hallway and there's Lamar. We don't see Lamar because he's kept with the football folks. We don't get to see Coach Harbaugh. And, uh, and so it's, it's vastly, vastly different. And, uh, but I think we're as well prepared to start the season as any team in the NFL, and we're about to find out. You prepared well, I, to watch a game on television, a Baltimore Ravens game? I know. Do you have a man cave or anything? I mean, where are you going to – like, have you figured this out? Have you ever done that, Kevin? No, he's never no, – he's missed one game. Uh, I asked I'm you this, right? Right, right. Did you miss yeah. one preseason game a billion years ago? Preseason. Yeah, I this missed a preseason game. Does Sally have to leave? Does she have to leave you all by yourself? Does she has, she has to go somewhere else that day because yeah. she's not sure how you're going to handle this? <laughs> no, he doesn't <laughs> yell out loud. I've sat near him for years. <laughs> well – I couldn't in the press box, but I made by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I you want know, a Kevin Cam. I want a burn <laughs> Cam. <laughs> you know, Kevin, you mentioned Dick. I, I actually texted Dick, and I laughed because, it, to me, it was so out of character, and I loved it, but maybe it's not out of character, when he was so frustrated over the stupidity of the mask thing. And I see Dick yeah. Cass being interviewed, and he's going, don't be a knucklehead, yeah. wear That's a right. mask. I actually That's had right. to look at my TV twice, wind <laughs> it back, was, was that Dick? That's, That's like an F-bomb people. for Dick, the That's knucklehead. It is. Yeah. <laughs> how, he's thinking, how hard can this be? There should be no debate. There should be no debate about wearing a mask. I don't want to make this political. But there should be no debate about wearing a mask. Well, I'll make it's it political. The state of Ohio, they're letting people in the stadium, Kevin. They're playing high school football in Ohio. I found that my out My high week. school. My high school is. And I'm, I'm a Cleveland uh, native, and my high school, St. Edwards High School, uh, has had two games so far. Well, hey, hey, Kevin, speaking of St. Edwards High School, one of the things we like to do <laughs> with guests on here. By the way, that's on the it, west side, not the east side, go. because well, you, you <laughs> got to know that about Cleveland. Kevin likes to talk about how they beat up on, I think it was Polly one day, was, weren't they bragging, Kevin, and, and your old alma mater was going to kick the daylights out of them or something? Was it Polly or was it somebody else from around here? They were, they were talking smack. It was Gilman. Gilman, was, there you go. It wasn't, it wasn't Polly. It was Gilman was talking smack. And I think your line was something like, um, you haven't played us yet or something. <laughs> We're from Ohio. <laughs> but Kevin, it's talk funny, a little There's bit. a funny story on this. Go ahead. Uh, you know, so Stan White's coaching at Gilman with Biff Pogey and those guys. And they're, they're running roughshod, you know. And, um, and so uh, Northeast Ohio football, high school football is pretty good. And my high school is pretty good and ranked usually in the top 25 in the country. Not this year, I don't think. But anyway, you know, uh, Stan White, who's from Northeast Ohio, said, boy, we would love to play like a St. Ed someday. And I said, well, you know, I know the principal over there. And yeah, I know the president. And I know the head coach. And, and so we arranged it. We arranged it. And uh, uh, a two, two-year series. And the first game was not so good for the Gilmans. And uh, but very good for St. Ed. The second year, Gilman uh, played tough, uh, and it was a much better, much much better game. So Stan was a happier man. <laughs> he was happy. <laughs> Kevin, he didn't, about, he, go ahead. he didn't say much after that first year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stan is known for his competitiveness. Trust me, oh, I mean, as you know. My God, <laughs> I, I there, yes. With, without saying much more, Kevin, talk a little bit about 
growing up where you did in St. Edwards? Because one of the things we try to do with our audience is give a, folks a sense of how men and women in their youth, how that forms who they are today. I mean, you're, you're a guy that's worked with people your whole life. You, 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 you get rave reviews as being a people person, as this guy that knows what he's doing, that cares about people. Talk about your youth and your, your mom and dad and growing up and how that form turned into who Kevin Byrne is. Tell them about the wrestling yeah. jacket, too. I want to hear that. <laughs> That's a good one. You know that one, Don? I don't. Oh, yeah. I got a, good, I got a, I got a story right. you haven't heard. Here we All go. right, we're going to get wrestling jacket, mom and dad growing up in Ohio. Well, uh, um, there, my mom, my mom and dad had five boys in seven years with two miscarriages for my mom. And, uh, um, so it, you know, uh, I, I ended up at St. Ed's, uh, for my last two years of high school because we got foreclosed out of our other house. So that just gives you an idea that, that our hist my history is, is not one of wealth and, uh, and privilege and, uh, um, and then uh, eight years after my youngest brother was born, my, my sister came. So we were a family of six and my parents. My oldest brother, Pat, was killed in Vietnam. Uh, so, so that was very important to, to the family, obviously. And uh, from, from high school, um, I applied to a couple colleges and ended up going to Marquette University just because it fit a little bit better financially than since some of the other schools I was looking at. And, uh, and, and then out of college, my first job was a sports information director at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, which I can't believe they hired me. And, uh, and that got me going. And so that's how it all started. By the way, we had Ken Singleton on last week, and he's cousins with Doc Rivers. And he told this that? incredible Doc Rivers, South Side of Chicago story, coming to Orioles games in the 70s. And that Doc had a chance to go play at Marquette. And, you know, of course, I had to drop your name on that. But, uh, you know, Marquette changes lives, right? Absolutely. It does. It does. Well, hey, the, Kevin, you alluded to you, you, your family lost their house in foreclosure. You, you said, look, we weren't rich. We, we were a family that was, you know, we were making ends, ends meet. Did, did that experience, is, I guess the term we all use today in political point, working class family, did that experience help form who you are? Did it, does it make you sensitive to people who need things, who perhaps things aren't going great? Did, did, did growing up with a, with, in a family where times weren't always easy, did, did that leave a forever imprint on you? Well, people had to help us, you know, so I saw that at an early age and, and, and sometimes it was our aunts and uncles and I saw the humility that comes with that you know, from my parents, from my dad, especially. And so, yeah, I, I think it, it can't have an impact on you. It's got to have a huge impact. So I, I, I am appreciative that I, that I had that type of experience and it, it makes you more sympathetic and makes you probably more generous when you get to have something and can share it. And uh, so then to, to be in an organization like the Ravens, the, you know, where, where they have continually given more, more than they need to, you know, like if I'm advising Steve, I'd be almost saying, yeah, enough's enough. You know, you're not going to improve your reputation anymore if you're doing this for business reasons, <laughs> you know, and yet, you know, when we see something in need and we go to Steve and say, yeah, he goes, yeah, let's do that. And, and he'll usually he'll come back in a bigger way than we think. It's, it's like the black lives matter movement, you know, and, or social justice, justice movements right now, you know, all of a sudden there's a million dollars. You figure out the best way to spend that, you know, okay. and, and let, and let, and let the players help make those decisions. Well, well, well Kevin, again, you, you've just, you alluded to again, the black lives matter and the social justice movement and the Ravens. Nestor was there at the beginning. You were there at the beginning. Every NFL team was there on September the 1st, 2016, when Colin Kaepernick took that knee in a preseason game. Talk about the NFL in 2016 versus the NFL in 2020. Kevin, uh, you and I were together, oh, geez, somewhere along the line, where there, there was actually serious discussion about the Ravens bringing Kaepernick in for a, a look 
and then after lengthy discussion, decided to go in another direction. Um, that was shortly after his girlfriend or wife had put some inappropriate things on social media. But the Ravens were involved in that. But give our listeners a sense of the NFL September 1st, 2016, and its fan, fan base, and the NFL September 2020? Well, uh, first of all, I don't think um, Colin did a great job of communicating what the message was, you know, and, uh, and, and but you have to have sympathy for him because you talk about standing alone. He was kind of, or kneeling alone or sitting alone. He even asked, you know, what's the, what's the best way to protest if I don't want to stand? You know, he was looked for advice. He looked to military folks for advice. It, he just didn't communicate the message well, and and we weren't paying enough attention, to be honest. And Roger Goodell, the commissioner, said that if we, we had to do it over again, we would have listened more to the message uh, that Colin was trying to to give, and and, and other players who joined them. Um, but I, it, it, the larger picture is. And Don, you and I are old men now. It, I don't, I don't, any person our age who looks like us and says that this is wrong, what we're doing, and this is all about the flag, and, and, and blacks should just stand up and go get a job and, and, and all that, then the best I can say about them is you've never had the experience of having a friend who's a minority. You've never had the experience of having a close business associate. It's a, it's a minority. They, they have been, for lack of a better term, screwed their entire lives. And if you, if you don't recognize that, then, you know, then you, I'm not blaming you. It just, you haven't had the experience. You have a blind spot. Kevin, Kevin, you, Nestor's a little younger than we are, but same same applies to him that I'm about to say. You and I and Nestor have never had to have the quote unquote talk with our sons. We never have. And there's not a black family or Hispanic family that has not. Right. I mean, I'm Eric Turner. Eric Turner, Nestor, you know, one of our first stars. Don, you know this. Safety, Pro Bowl safety. Uh, pre-law student UCLA in law school uh, while he's playing football. I'm watching. They're announcing. They, the word is out. The OJ trial is going to end. They're going to announce the verdict. And, uh, and, and we're with the Cleveland Browns at that time. And so I, I'm going by the player's lounge and the verdict's being announced. That's where the big television was in there. And, and it was, I would say, maybe 35 players in there. And I would say at least 25 of them are black. And so they announced the verdict that OJ is innocent. And they are jumping up and down, the, the, the black players. The white players, not much response. And I, in the back room, I see Eric Turner, who I have a great relationship with. He is throwing his fist up, yes, yes, yes. And I'm startled by it. I'm, I'm startled by it. So the next day I see Eric Turner, I said, Eric, I said, uh, do you think O.J. Simpson killed his wife? And he goes, yes. Uh, he's from L.A., Eric is. And so he has connections there. And I said, uh, well, I saw you when the verdict was given yesterday, and you cheered like crazy. Can I ask you why? He goes, yeah. He goes, I'll tell you why, because we never get away with anything. And, and, and you'll never understand. And then he, he said to me, he says, what kind of car do I drive? And I said, you have a silver Mercedes convertible. And, and, and Eric says, I've had it two years. And, uh, and he said, and I live in the progressive city of Cleveland. I said, yes. And he goes, how many times do you think I've been stopped in my car? And I said, I don't know. He goes, I've been stopped six times. One time with my mother, five times with my girlfriend all at night, all coming out of a restaurant or going into a restaurant, near a restaurant, just going out, something you'll and your kids will never, ever have to deal with it. How would you like to live like that? And I said, I, you know, yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. 
That, that is so poignant, Kevin. I, it, it takes me, Nestor, I don't know if I've told you this story. I, I can remember it vividly. We had a department head meeting when Kevin Kamenitz was county executive, and we were discussing the issue of driving while black in Baltimore County. And we were talking about what a difficult issue it was and how we needed more data. And anecdotally, we felt there was an issue there. And courageously, at least three that I can remember, maybe more, of our African-American department, I remember specifically Dr. Gregory Branch, the head of the health department in Baltimore County, he's been on Baltimore Positive, put his hand up and he said, Mr. Executive, I just want you to know, I've, I've been stopped more than once leaving my office uh, for bogus reasons in Baltimore County. And then another African-American department head, you know, people with multiple degrees put their hands up. So th these things are, are real. And it's just interesting to watch the shift, as you said, whether it's Godell or others. Uh, what's your sense about fans, Kevin? Are, are fans shifting or are they still late to this party because it's a very diverse fan base there was a lot of pushback four years ago right yeah. Kaepernick even the rumors that you right. were going to sign Kaepernick right oh yeah oh yeah and you know and, and frankly that uh after our video you know we had a couple season ticket holders to say uh well I'm just telling you you can put out that video but if I see a player kneel I want my money back I'm done you know you know so you know the the, the business reality you know, and we don't do it for business reasons is, Don, we don't care about you and me, you know, because we're not purchasing very much anymore. Right. And sponsors don't want us because we're making lifetime purchases. and <laughs> We're not coming back in a year or two years. We're, we're not in that coveted 18 to 35 demographic. I think you both got 30, 40 years left in you, man. I've seen science. I mean, look at what we're doing on Zoom, man. I mean, come on. But what the deep study is, and, and which I think is promising for our country and for our families, is that we are being led by the youth of America because they see it, you know, because they are more um, sensitive to racial injustice than we were. And I thought we were because I was, as Nestor alluded with the letter jacket, we 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 protested back in the day in the late sixties and early seventies and and uh, and and there was revolution at that time, but obviously it wasn't enough. So th there is a a whole new segment of society that it, that looks at the leaders in the NFL or the NBA uh, or or baseball, whatever sport it might be. Celebrity are, are now becoming are becoming the leaders of, of our country. And, and what they are saying more so, unfortunately for your business, Don, I think, people aren't believing and listening to politicians very much anymore. No, I know you moved to South Carolina, difficult. so you're voting down there. So, you know, we, 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 we hope you send change to D.C., and I think you know <laughs> what we're talking about. So. Hey, uh, but, Nestor, before you let Kevin get out of here, a couple quick things. One, most important, at some point when we're post-COVID, I hope the boys and I can come down and tee it up with you one day. Sure, sure. <laughs> we'll give you, give you I'm a I'm not call. playing any golf. I, when we'll Hootie the to... Blowfish is in town, I'll come down and drink yeah. beer, but I'm not playing any golf. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to keep it in the fairway. you got and a then, beach near there, right? I'm in. I'm in. I'm coming. Oh, there you yeah, go. yeah. And how good, how good, how good are the Ravens going to be, Kevin? Well, I if think they don't have, be, if they don't have significant injuries, I always preface it. Well, with I that. think we can be uh, better than last season, and we were fourteen and two last season. You know, Lamar's seventeen games more experience. Uh, Hollywood Brown is not hurt anymore. Uh, those draft choices look pretty good. We didn't have Calais Campbell a year ago. Um, uh, Marcus Peters has now had a training camp with us. I just think there are so many positives for us. And I think if, if, if there, are, there are a handful of franchises, and maybe less than a handful, that you could look that COVID is creating a lot of difficulties for teams. So – Who's going to handle those better? Who's going to get their team prepared the best? Um, I would think that if you asked all 32 head coaches and general managers to vote 
for the teams that prepared for this the best, sight unseen, we'd be in everybody's top three. Kevin, and, uh, big appreciation for you and, and all you've done here and all you're still uh, doing. And, uh, I, you know, I, I guess at some point we'll be in the same room. It almost feels like we visited. I mean, just, you know, <laughs> I'm missing out a little bit of the food and soup in the corner, a little dessert or something <laughs> right. like that. It's nice yeah. tea, but it, it was nice to see you. And, uh, nice, you know, nice and, and I know there's a lot of people out there happy you left your basketball and your racquetball game. <laughs> that with you. So. Stay safe, Kevin. Thank you. You, see, you too, guys. Thanks for the opportunity. Kevin Burns, Senior Vice President Emeritus of something or another. He's in Hilton Head hitting golf balls and watching football, and we're all, all trying to hold it together here. Don Moeller, on behalf of all of our sponsors at Taharka, our friends at Stay Fair, and our, our Fadley's Crab Cakes, and shipping them all over the country. Even ship those down in South Carolina. And Moeller and Gary Realty. I am Nestor Aparicio. Nasty at WNST.net reaches me as we begin the merger of WNST and Baltimore Positive. We are Baltimore Positive.